Friends, welcome to the third video. This is the strengthening of the Lord, part three. In this video, we're going to dig into the comparing of the two events. The Moses story, where strengthening does occur, and we see the result of that. And in the Josiah story, where strengthening is not allowed to cook. And in this Josiah circumstance, we see the result of that. We're also going to take a moment and I'm going to tell you guys a real life story about somebody who is in uh, the Passover event and needs to be strengthened and how somebody rightfully, rightfully defended them when they were being called out for some sin that they hadn't had the time yet to figure out. Enjoy this video. Thank you for being here and be pleasing in his sight. God wants to sanctify you. It's God's desire to sanctify you. So as we transition from Josiah's tragic story to the Israelite story of triumph, let's look at Moses. In Egypt, the people were surrounded by idolatry, much like Josiah's Israel. In both circumstances, the idolatry without gets completely destroyed, but the idolatry within stays fully intact. Here is where these two historical events fork. And the lesson of the importance of the strengthening of the Lord begins to glimmer, shining and teasing the attentive from way off in the distance, deep in the folds of one's mind, on a black sea where light is beginning to grow. In Josiah's story, the Lord chooses to take the strong, just, and willing leader from the people right after the proverbial Pesach event, which also is a literal Pesach event. In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went to the aid of the king of Assyria to the river in Euphrates. And King Josiah went against him, and Pharaoh Nego killed him at Megiddo when he confronted him. Whereas in Moses' story, Moses leads Israel right up until they crossed into the Promised Land. Egypt's Israel did not have their best leader taken from them. Why? And I said Egypt on purpose. Egypt's leader. Israelites that were taken taken out of Egypt. They were basically Egyptians. Whereas the Israelites, they did have their best leader taken from them in Josiah's story. Then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. Also, the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. The Lord Elohim himself crosses over before you. I'm going to cut in here to note something. There's one thing, one thing that he commands this people. It's not to be loving. It's not to be kind. It's not to suffer. In this particular circumstance, at this coming to the end of the salvation journey, getting to the promised land, they are given the instruction to be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, the nations. For the Lord your Elohim, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Let us digress for a moment. Not from the general idea that we're painting, but from the contrasting of these two biblical events. This is for the purpose of a real life, right now during this time story that touches on this subject. I was recently getting a haircut and there was a woman and I overheard her telling a story about how she defended a 60-something year old woman in the church that she was, or it, sorry, is a part of. This woman was being accused of uh, witchcraft and her angle of defense for this woman, well, before I say that, let me set the setting a little bit here for you. This church is known as a place where drug addicts um, who are in recovery and criminals who are recovering from their criminal behaviors where they go. The pastor, he was in prison for a long time and then he started the church, Kingdom Life Church in Muskegon, Michigan, once he came out of prison. 
Now this 60 year old new believer was and still is a broken person surviving life and had very recently decided to turn to God, which is monumental, it's, it's awesome. The woman at my haircut telling her story was aware of this and told of how she defended the woman. Now look at this, her angle was not that she was not guilty of such things. Her angle was simply that she was taking some baby steps in faith. She was defending her because she had she had done the proverbial Passover, and she had people attacking her for habits that she had not broken yet. She had not taken the time yet. She had not been yet given the time to be strengthened against those habits. This obviously is not an excuse to ignore sin, but it is the reason mercy exists. She had not yet been strengthened in her faith because she had spent her entire life in the sin of rebellion, and only very recently had made the wonderful and faithful decision to turn to God. In Josiah's circumstance, Elohim judged the people unworthy to take the journey farther than the Passover. As a result, Josiah was killed, and the people were handed over to the lusts of their hearts. This teaches us that the strengthening of the Lord is much, much more than a one-time event. It's a lifestyle, a daily lifestyle. Much like marriage is much, much more than the wedding day, reception, and honeymoon, it is why we are to be the bride in the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's why God hates divorce. We see Elohim strengthening his people in the wilderness journey. Josiah's story shows the severity of God. Moses' story shows both the goodness and the severity of God. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. I want to note here that this is a prime example of the scripture that shows us that there is not a separation between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Tanakh and the Brit Hadashah. Here we are in Romans, and Romans is using the truth of the Tanakh to teach us the reality of the world that we live in today. In Moses' circumstance, Israel began completely helpless and weak, but with a willing heart to walk in faith. Look at this. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. Okay, so all that was said because it is an example of a work that the Lord did to save his children while they were weak, not yet strengthened. Stick with me here. We're talking about salvation. This here is a work of salvation, one of the beginning works. It is a literal event that represents a spiritual thing. saving his children while they were weak, not yet strengthened, but in his wisdom knew that in the future some would subject themselves to his strengthening. Another event the Lord orchestrated here that he failed to do for Josiah's people was actively fighting against the enemy who pursued them. The Almighty purposefully failed to do so in Josiah's case. In fact, people were given over to Egypt and Babylon not because of Satan, but because of God's goodness and severity. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And when morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. 
So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Here we are showing an example where the Lord actively did all of the fighting for a people who was too weak to do the fighting for themselves because he knew that some of them would subject themselves to his strengthening and become strong so that they could fight with him. This event is the last time, though, that we see this picture, the picture of a weak and helpless Israel, doing nothing more to actively fight alongside God against the enemy, other than simply walking the path that he gave them to walk. Later, after a few wilderness events of strengthening, we find Israel fighting the enemy alongside God. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel and Rephidim, and so it was when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. After this event, we see a continuance of God strengthening his people where they are weak and testing their strength. God continued to fight for them and with them against their enemies, both without and within. Now, when contrasting the well-known wilderness journey with the not-so-well-known Josiah story, the story of a righteous Judean king who had every intention of leading his people in God's strengthening, we see the resultant reality of a people unwilling to progress in their relationship with God. Here, we contrast that sad story with the victorious story of those who are willing to take strength and fight alongside God against the nations to find generations of peace in the Promised Land. Okay, so that wraps up our Tanakh talk. Tanakh is the Old Testament, as most people understand it to be, but it does not conclude the Bible's teaching on the reality of the strengthening of the Lord. What did Yeshua have to say about this? Hmm? Hmm? What about Paul? Well, I will touch on that here. But if you have not hardened your hearts today when hearing God's words, you now see a pattern, a precious pattern of God's character. And the same Father who leads me in study will lead you in your studies as you study yourself approved. You will uncover the mysteries of God for yourself. But let's wrap up by touching on the entrance to this illustrious cave of wonders in the Brit Kadashah. That's the New Covenant in Hebrew, which many call the New Testament. Yeshua was about to go to death. Remember, we're just touching on this. It is all over the darn place. Yeshua was about to go to death. His disciples were quite convinced that they would follow him anywhere. Yeshua was aware that as certain as they were, they were not able. How did he know this? He knew that they lacked the strength to follow their words. The strength, at least, to that degree. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, Yeshua rightly told them. Did they get angry? Are you calling us weak, bro? Hmm? No, they did not get angry. Yeshua loved them, and they respected what he had to say. And the disciples were not easily offended. So they are blessed. Yeshua's Bible was the Tanakh. He had a deep and applicable understanding of everything you just learned and more. He taught it. He lived it. He tells us to walk as he walked. The vast majority of us have willing spirits. But most, especially in these days, are complacent. And we bend to the will of the weak flesh more often than not. This is not okay, like the church teaches. What's further, the most of the teachers encourage and coddle the weak behavior while discouraging, to say the least, and to put it lightly, strong behavior against the ways of the world, even if done in maturity and grace. This rebellion to God's strengthening is reflected not in the world around us, but in the church around us, y'all. 
The giants win when good men fail to act. The spirit is willing. But the flesh is so weak. Our land is sick, is it not? Is it because Satan is attacking us? No, it's not. Our forefathers knew better than to let that sidetrack them from their relationship with God. Whenever the snakes came, the pestilence, the sword, it was always, God is against us. We need to repent. What does God tell us about how to heal a land? He tells us that if we repent, he will heal our land. This is not a message that was sent to the nations in the heathen. The strengthening of the Lord is the result of turning to God, Yeshua Messiah, knowing full well that a time of strengthening will define several seasons of your life. Don't fight God's love for you. Don't continue in your weaknesses. But instead, take faith and be strengthened. Walk in strength. Mercy it does have a finish line for you because God loves you and because his love is flawlessly good. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Messiah Yeshua has also laid hold of me. You hear that? This is the very reason why the Messiah has laid hold of you. And Messiah doesn't fail. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward, progressing, right, to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Messiah, Yeshua. Therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. It's a powerful, powerful message of progression from Philippians. Remember those things next time somebody tells you that you are to stay weak. Again, I have only brushed on the strengthening of the Lord found in the Brit, the new and I implore you to pray, read, and act in faith. Studying yourself approved to find where Yeshua's message of salvation can be found in more of its fullness, even though the enemy has put a veil over that message. Only Messiah can lift that veil, and with him being a loving gentleman, he will not force you to lift it. Let him grab your hand, putting it to the plow, and walk with him, prune with him, water with him, for yourself first. And once you have been strengthened, then you will know how to strengthen others. Walk with him, behind him, letting him have the authority and being the strength behind his actions that come through you. Let him be your king, your God. Thanks for watching this video, guys. If you have enjoyed this content, it's really helpful when you do the thumbs up, hit the thumbs up icon. If you haven't subscribed yet, why not? Hit that subscribe button. And if you hit the bell icon, then there's no way that you can miss when I upload content. I kind of upload content at random because I own my own business even though I'm a minister. And I do that so that I can relate to my people more fully and so that I don't have to ask for money. Now, if you know somebody who you think could benefit from this, I'm not talking about saying, oh, you need to see this to see how wrong you are. I'm talking about somebody who kind of is already on that right track. And if you think that this video will encourage them, you should find a share button somewhere on your screen. And if you hit share, copy link, and then uh, that'll put that in your clipboard and you can text that or email that to anyone sharing this video, doing those few little things, 
just the click of a button, believe it or not, spreads the gospel message. And that gospel message, when it takes root in people's hearts, it serves God. Because He loves us. And He wants to be in relationship with us, with all of our friends and family. And he wants to be in relationship with you. Kazak, Kazak. Be strong. Be strong. Amen. And hallelujah. God is good. <laughs>